What? What? What are you doing? Pandora's eating a fly. Good job, I guess. Ugh. Hello, my dears, and welcome. I'm Mariana, and today I'm going to tell you the story of the 3,000-year-old murder that changed the world. The topic today is divine, feminine, and patriarchy, and really, you can't talk about one without discussing the other. Today, divine feminine has become something of like a clickbait term almost. When you look up the divine feminine hashtag on Instagram, it's basically the mission statement for Beyonce's Lemonade album with like a pink background and sparkles. But truly, the divine feminine is a profound archetypal phenomenon. It is the numinous feminine principle. It's the divine expression of symbolic womanhood. And it is so popular now because it's finally being rediscovered. There is finally room in the world again for the divine feminine, even though most of us don't know what the heck it is. Okay, so what is the divine feminine really? I literally did two years of research to answer that question and... The divine feminine is so mysterious and indefinable because for the last several thousand years, it has been repressed in us, meaning that it's had to live unconsciously. It's been barred from its full natural expression in the world. Why? Patriarchy. Now I know all of you have an idea of what patriarchy is, but basically it's a hierarchical social structure in which men are on top. Men hold most or all of the power, which means maleness is valued over femaleness. Male expression is prioritized. The consequence, of course, then, is the suppression of femaleness, or just natural, organic femininity in whatever form it takes. So when we talk about the divine feminine, we're not talking about some mysterious energy or self-love or being in some kind of girly flow. We really can't confuse it with fashion aesthetics or biological bodies. As an archetype, it exists internally within us, unconsciously, but we all have access to this archetype and we all hold an image of it. Just like the divine masculine, we might all kind of go to an image of like a Judeo-Christian god, some white-haired dude on a throne looking very stern. When we think of the divine feminine, we should also be able to conjure an image of what that archetype is. So let's do that. Let's all just like conjure the image of the divine feminine. So I'll, I'll give you a minute. Yeah, that was a little harder than expected, wasn't it? We don't have a clear image of the Divine Feminine because of how long she's been repressed, how long she's been pushed as far down in our psyches as possible. But it's not like we don't have any images of the Feminine. We have our witches and princesses and seductresses who are all figures of power in their own right. But there's something off about them, isn't there? Witches are evil. Princesses are weak. Seductresses are manipulative. It's because in order to maintain patriarchy, the masculine has to be the clear dominant force. It has to be rightfully more valuable than the feminine, which means that the feminine, in comparison, becomes corrupted, corroded. And so now, I'm gonna tell you the story of the murder that changed the world as we know it. In the first millennium BC, the Babylonian goddess Tiamat was assassinated Tiamat was the goddess of the primordial sea, creatrix of the cosmos, mother of all. But the gods entered a civil war, and the coalition of deities against the mother goddess elected a sacrificable, fresh-faced god named Marduk. They promised him that if he succeeded as their champion, they would allow him to take her place as the greatest in the divine pantheon. So Marduk armed himself with a bow arrows, a net, and a mace. He filled his belly with fire, his hands with lightning. But Tiamat also came prepared, meeting him in the form of a snarling sea dragon. But somehow, despite all her power, and against all odds, in a flash, Marduk trapped her in his net and stabbed Tiamat through the heart. The battle won, 
Marduk took the murdered body of Tiamat and cleaved it in two, making the heavens out of one half and the earth out of the other. All the world was made from the mother goddess, but by the champion god. Today, Tiamat is almost entirely forgotten, and those who do remember her don't think of her as an emanation of the great goddess, but as the draconic monstrous of Dungeons and Dragons. But she's essential to the story of patriarchy and the divine feminine. Classicist Robert Graves claims that it was the murder of Tiamat that confirmed the paradigm shift from matriarchy to patriarchy, or in a more modern sense, from a mother-made world to a father-made one. Because the world wasn't patriarchal in the beginning, we've all been told forever that this is just naturally the way the world works, but it's just not true. We've all heard the story of the caveman hunter warriors, that from the very beginning, the world was hierarchical, cutthroat, and male-dominated. But the early scholars who came up with those narratives were entrenched in thousands of years of patriarchy. They literally couldn't imagine a world that was not patriarchal, that was even matrifocal, meaning women-centered and equalitarian. In fact, a really fascinating discovery made in the last decade found that those cave paintings of hands were likely not actually made by the hunter-warriors trying to leave their mark on the world, as scholars always said, but were made by women who were there to perform sacred rituals or maybe even just to make art. Patriarchy happened. It was not something that just came on its own. It was a calculated, violent shift by male-dominated societies to conquer more territory. And truly, it spread like a cancer through the ancient world. Side note, when I wrote my master's thesis on archetypal transformations of the divine feminine in the West, I literally wrote that in my paper. And my um, cowboy boot-wearing, white-haired, upper west side male advisor wrote, wait, what was it? Am I about to go find the first draft of my thesis right now? Naha! Wow. Here it is. It wasn't all bad, was it? Why did I choose an elderly white-haired man to be an advisor on a project that was about the feminist deconstruction of the patriarchal oppression of divinity? Have I mentioned my creepy obsession of old men? Just see. Just, just watch the video. To answer my professor, no, it wasn't all bad. Patriarchy is not inherently a malevolent system, but it is a system that is sort of built on oppression. It requires the dominion of men over women. It was not enough to just take them over with swords and fire. There had to be an ideological shift a dismantling of the power that women innately had in society due to their association with the divine feminine, with the great goddess that so many of these civilizations worshipped. That was the only way for patriarchal dominion to really take hold and last. And boy has it lasted. In order for women as a group to be subjugated, the divine feminine that they embody has to suffer the same. Therefore, the innate, life-giving, magnificent power of the great goddess was maligned, destroyed, or just outright dismissed. Now, as we literally smash the patriarchy, the divine feminine has room to rise. But we do her a disservice when we reduce her to female power or just a soft femme presentation. It's not the opposite of masculinity. It's its own living essence that we are tasked with discovering. And we know too that we need her to be a symbol, a rallying cry for women to finally revive the power that they inherently hold. The divine feminine is also brutal and wise and sensual and glorious. In order to truly heal and embody the divine feminine, we have to be willing to do the massive work of seeking her out, of finding out who she really is. I have been on a journey to discover the Divine Feminine for years. What I know is that she's immensely powerful. She is wisdom and truth. Her body and her soul are one. She is earth 
and sky and love and fear. She is the keeper of the divine mysteries. She is the warden of the underworld. She is the cocoon in which we are all reborn. And still I know nothing. For years I've been seeking her and I still am and I always will be. I will always be learning how to unbury her from my own depths. I don't mean to wax poetic, but I can't talk about the Divine Feminine without my heart exploding a little bit. Our work as witches, as spiritual healers, as seekers, is to be the vessels, is to allow her to fill us so that we may fully know her and then spread that knowledge with the world. So thank you for taking the time to hear her story today. Thank you for making the space in your mind and in your heart. And thank you for allowing me to tell you my story as I just try to figure out with you and do my part. If you like this video, please subscribe. It means a lot to me as I'm trying to grow my channel. And please post a comment if there's any topics you would like me to explore. And let me know what your experience is with the Divine Feminine. I'm super curious. I love to hear people's stories, so put that in the comments. And I'm going to let you guys choose what my next video will be, so make sure if you're not following me on Instagram, definitely do that. Um, and if you're interested in supporting me as a creator, you can check out my Patreon too. And please, do your part if that feels right to you. The more we heal her, the more we heal the world. And that work is seeking the divine feminine in yourself, reclaiming her in whatever natural form she takes inside of you. So thank you and have a beautiful, meaningful day, my friends. Hi, honey. Hi. You coming here? You're coming to me? You wanna come to me? No, you don't. Of course you don't. You wanna mess with the lights.